recording this, so it's recording now. First of all, um, thanks for attending. And I, I know everybody is uh, uh, super uh, super busy, and um, but in, in the in the sport that we've all chosen, uh, data data is just absolutely critical to success. And uh, and in order to do to do that, uh, it is. It is not easy to implement, but it is achievable. It's something that can be learned. Software is getting better and better on, on, on all the different programs that are out there, and um, and so it is achievable. It's something you can learn. It just takes a little bit of a little bit of work and effort. The um, uh, who am I and why am I presenting? Right. The, it appears that I've lost my arms in that picture, but I I I, I swear I do have them. So. Uh, why am I presenting? First of all, uh, you know I'm the AIM Sports Training Manager. I've been doing uh, you know, the training seminars and and uh, track site support and, and stuff for years. Uh, recently, went to work for them full time, and uh, so this is what we do. And uh, been all over the country doing seminars for uh, uh, for different shops and tracks and and, and race groups uh, for about the last four or five months full time, and uh, and expect to be doing a lot more in the spring. The uh, about 35 years in racing and. Uh, 27 years uh, formal informal training of different uh, technology uh, from the from the surveying world through data collection and and and, and a lot of other things so so those are uh, some things that we've been doing the uh, and and why on the Mazda site the uh, the Mazda racer site the uh, family race Mazdas for several years I see uh, Mike Collins has given me a bit of a hard time calling me names on my on my question thing. Uh, the first race that we went to and met a lot of these folks, uh, Mike Collins was there and helped me fix a stripped out spark plug on this very car that's on the on the screen. Uh, we started racing that spec Miata in 2005 in the northwest region and uh, and then 2006 went to the to the runoffs where my son Andrew was uh, lucky enough to win. So uh, we have a background in spec Miata. Then we then we moved up into the uh, the MX-5 Cup where he finished second place in uh, in the MX-5 series and a um, couple years in the Mustang Challenge um, series as champions uh, did pretty well there and then uh, and then the last couple years been racing uh, off-road trucks and um, and in uh, second place in 2010 and won the championship this year so the reason that I we, we've raised some other things in our family and did some different things but I put these ones up here specifically because number one they're lately and number two they're all spec, which means that they're very critical to to getting the most out of what you got. And uh, and and even the off-road truck, it's spec on suspension, it's spec on horsepower, it's spec on the transmission. Everything is spec. So uh, all of these things that we're talking about here is very very important to get the the most out of what you got, and uh, in order to do well. So data has been critical, just absolutely critical in in uh, in success in these classes. Okay, the, a little bit of our agenda, just to give you an idea of where we're kind of kind of head. You know, uh, I break down data in a, in a pretty simple way, and, and what you're going to see is what is data acquisition. You know, different methods, kind of just another tool in the toolbox. We're going to talk a little bit about hardware and software and configuration and analysis, but basically, what is data acquisition? The second big, the you know, overreaching topic will be why use it. You know why use data acquisition for some of the things that I use it for, and I believe that the best way to use it and the best way to think about it is vehicle development, driver development, and then catching issues or problem solving. You know those are my three main places that we use it. Of course, there's reporting and there's there's all sorts of subsets of, of data acquisition and what we use it for. But that's the uh, that's the bottom line is is uh, what is it, why is it, and then of course how to use it. And there's where we're going to talk a little bit more in in some detail. Uh, selecting sensors, you know, installation discussion about that, and uh, the uh, software interface, uh, analyzing data, and, and of course uh, some reports at the end to help us uh, to help us move forward. The um, uh, all the way through this, we're gonna you know, 90 minutes is is a fairly short amount of time. So what we're the whole goal here is to to not necessarily teach you everything there is to know about data, but just show you that there's ways to do it. Overreaching overall thinking ways of of, uh, of strategy on how to get from point A to point B, uh, and 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 how to move forward into making this something that you can use. Uh, just so you know, uh, when everybody signed up, there was a little bit of a questionnaire there. Some, uh, there were some questions there about um, 
comments of things that you wanted to see. I included as many as those as I could. You know, some of them were uh, were a little bit deep to include into something like this. If I if I don't cover what you put in your uh, in your response, just uh, you know, maybe we can talk about it later, or or just realize that I did read it and uh, and and uh, and tried to include it as much as we can. I do have a, a question just came up from I'm going to ignore Mike Collins's comment, but the uh, <laughs> Frank. Frank asks a question, how specific will this be to AIM systems versus TrackMate, for example? I work pretty hard on, on um, uh, keeping it as generic as possible, just so everybody knows. The, the, trend, the, the trend of reading graphs and understanding I, there's, there's, is, is universal. I, we did, I did not go in to push this button to get here, push this button to get there. We didn't get into that kind of uh, level. Basically, everything here is theory and, and, and overall application of the technology. So uh, if you are a user of another product, uh, uh, you're still going to have some value here. And of course, we'll try to bring you to the other side at some point. No, just, uh, just joking. So th those are, but with the agenda, that's basically how you see it, see it's going to work. It's going to be what is it, why use it, and how to use it. We are going to use, uh, of course, AIM, AIM software to, to project it, but, but uh, uh, the theory is all the same. Okay. We're, another thing that we're going to do here is we're going to ask these poll questions. I think there's going to be five of them as we go along here. And it's just to get some feedback from you, keep everybody uh, in, into, into watching what they're doing. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, I have a question here for you. Let's look at this one and, and, um, and give me an answer. Well, when you are done today, when we are done in our 90 minutes, what is the area that you hope to understand more about regarding data acquisition? That... Um, just general concepts, planning, hardware, data analysis report. Just kind of pick one of them there and, and uh, give me an idea of what you uh, what you think. While you guys are answering that, Jim did ask a question. Uh, can everyone else see the questions or only me? I I believe only I can, but uh, but I've not been on the other end of this at this point. So uh, I think some of the comments that I'm getting from some of the other ones, but uh, but uh, I think it's only me. I see somebody else saying only me, so that's uh, that's good. Perfect, perfect. Okay, I appreciate that. We've got about almost 100% of the people voted, so that's great. Uh, let me put those up here for you to see it. I think. Uh, let's see, I can share that answer for you, so everybody can uh, everybody can see what the basically the uh, at the end of the day, you guys are 75% of you are asking that you hope to know a little bit more about the data analysis, and frankly, that's what I saw as well when uh, when when. Uh, when I got the questions as far as the, the when you registered so that is where we went we spent I'm spending a lot of time on just reading of graphs understanding what to, what the next sensor could be to help you understand what that graph means things like that that's what you're gonna see here in a, in, a, in, a, in a little bit I spend zero time on hardware so that's good and uh, general concepts we're gonna spend some time on general concepts because I think that really helps you understand the data analysis side a, a little bit better at least that's the way I took the general concepts and the planning and strategy helps you get better data analysis. So that uh, gives you an idea of kind of where we're going to go. Okay, let's jump back in to the, to, the, to the rest of it again after that poll. What is data acquisition? This is kind of where we're going to start and start digging in. Okay. There's different methods of data acquisition, and uh, and if you think about these, open your mind a little bit, kind of figure out, you know, seat of the pants. You know, before we had all this cool electronics or or stopwatches or video and all these different things, drivers would go out and and drive the car and come back in and said, hey, it feels it, you know, it's it's understeer in, it's oversteer out, whatever it happens to be, and they'd make changes. I, I consider that to be a form of uh, data acquisition, and I also consider the stopwatch, the video, and the data systems themselves all to be all to be great tools, but I also think that you should not limit yourself to one of them. Uh, some of the best data guys that I work with that, uh, that get the most out of their data systems are also the drivers or have drivers that can give good feedback. There's a lot of data at the end of the day, at the end of a session even, and if, you're, if your driver doesn't tell you, hey, down in turn three, I'm struggling that's where I'm having some issues. It's very hard to filter through and go in and dig around and get to exactly what you're looking for. So, uh, seat of the pants is a great one. Stopwatch, obviously, you know we're in a performance-based industry here. That's what we do. Speed is everything. Uh, lap times are everything. So, uh, stopwatch is is something that we that we really worry about, obviously, and the values that show up on it. 
uh, video. You know, we uh, video can capture some things that you that is hard to see in data. Sometimes you can see some things in video that uh, don't always hold true in the data. So uh, it's a great complement to the to the tool, and uh, and um, I think that's uh, something that's worth having as well. And uh, and of course the data acquisition systems, and that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to we're going to um, uh, mainly spend our time on the on the software side, but we will look at a little bit on the hardware. Okay. Data, just another tool in the toolbox, kind of an old saying, but but uh, uh, I see a data logger as just another uh, tool, just like an engine or a shock dyno. It all this data system is doing is measuring and recording performance, and uh, uh, and it's not uh, the data system itself. The black box that we're using is not just vehicle performance. It's measuring. It's not just measuring driver performance, but the overall performance. It measures. You know the vectors, the speed, the g's, the the water temperatures, all that stuff, and just gathers it. You know, and and it doesn't separate out vehicle versus driver performance at that point. You know, uh, the bottom line is when it's all said and done, is the software is what makes that happen. And uh, so the way I look at it is, hardware is good, has to work, has to be easy to install, all all that stuff has to be there. And um, but in reality, you spend all your time doing data in in the software. That's where we uh, we make a that detailed analysis possible of starting to break down, you know, straightaway speeds, corner speeds, apexes, all the different things that we want to get to. Okay. Just a little bit, you know, when, when you're going to purchase hardware, I know almost all of you have it, but you probably went through this and other folks may be watching this that, uh, that haven't got it yet. But when you start to look at hardware, the, the bottom line that I, I think about when I, when I talk with people about buying it is, is can it do what you want? Is it expandable? firmware upgradable, uh, are these things important to you? If they are, you look at certain levels. If they aren't, you look at other levels, uh, you know, definable sample rates, uh, memory, you know, alarm and shift lights, all these different things. It's just pick out what you want in the hardware. Make sure you get what you want. Spend just a little bit of time with a pad of paper and just lay out what you're really after. And uh, the same thing is, is, uh, is true of the software. You know, it, it needs to be robust and capable of doing what you want, you know, and uh, because this is where you spend your time. Once you get the darn uh, hardware mounted and start using it, uh, software is where you spend all your time. And, uh, of course, ease of use uh, and, 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 and the important front side of both, of both hardware and software is, of course, the training and support, frequency of updates, and, and, and of course, cost. You know, we help, these are basically the ideas that, that I always think about when I'm going to go out and purchase something like this. So we just throw them into a slide, and, and uh, we can talk about it a little bit that way. Everybody agree with some of those points? Go ahead and uh, click on your on your little hand and, and let me know that uh, that uh, you see that you understand it and that's that's a pretty good way of looking at it. Great, perfect. Okay, I'm gonna put all those down and move on to the next slide. The uh, when you get into the software side, it's really a two 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 part you know, process as far as uh, working with, with, the, with the software itself. Uh, configuration and the analysis side. You, you got to get in there and you got to use something that sets up the data loggers and gets everything exactly like you want it, and that's the configuration side. You, you set up, you tell it what sensors are coming to it, sampling rates, alarms, shift lights, wherever you want them, and that's the configuration side. The side we're going to spend all our time on today is on the data analysis side. And... Um, you know, main analysis functions, depending on what you're after, is uh, you measure plots, maps, histograms, those kind of things. And, uh, and of course, plots are the way that, we're, that most people look at their data, and that's where we're going to spend a lot of our time here today. Okay. Why use it? You know, and this picture, I've seen this picture on the right with all the, the spec Miatas lined up at Laguna. I can't tell how many are there, but that's got to be somebody on the... On, on the in the in the webinar probably knows, but gosh, they're four wide by more than ten deep, right? I, yeah, seventy-two. Somebody says that the reason that you would want to use data acquisition is because the top third of that field is no doubt, you know, at, now at this point certainly, and they're they're faster because of it. And uh, yeah, why use data acquisition? It's because you know you you got to go pretty pretty darn fast, pretty darn fast. So we need to use uh, everything that's available to us at the time. So what uh, the way that I look at this, what do you think of that car there, Mike? Thought you'd like that one on the top. Uh, 
why use data acquisition systems? Vehicle development is one of the ones that I that I uh, that I like, and uh, you you've got a task here. A lot of you build your own cars. A lot of you like to work on your stuff. You have uh, vehicle development that you have in mind. Uh, one of the things that I always try to get folks to understand and, and use data for is not just a speed, you know, to increase speed of a driver, speed of a of a car, but also use it to think outside the box. Think about things that you want to do. Uh, vehicle development is one of those things, and uh, sometimes you have to throw some additional sensors at it, but you can get there. Uh, on this slide here, before before it's done, this is my basic theory of, of of data acquisition. You need to determine what the vehicle is doing in order to, to to help develop it, and the driver, frankly. What is the vehicle doing? And then you need to know when the vehicle is doing it. Is it on entry? Is it at the apex? Is it the middle? Is it down the middle of the straightaway? You know, it, sometimes it's easy to figure out what it's doing, but the next step is, of course, when, so you know what pieces to fix, and if and and you need to know why the vehicle is doing it. If uh, if if something is happening, we got to we got to dig our way into why, because until you know those three those three things, it's all a guess on how you fix it, and uh, and and make it better. And sometimes we're talking, you know, you know, uh, you know, five hundredths or a tenth. For every two or three corners, ends up being a huge amount in a spec Miata. So, so uh, we're looking for little things here, and and in order to catch those, when the when the car is at its at its at its at its, at its meanest point, when you really got it g'd up, and you're in a corner, and you're under braking, and you're downshifting, and all that, the driver can't give you feedback as well as as what you want because it's very busy at that point in time, obviously. So, data helps us break that down. So, knowing what it is, when, and why is is uh, is very important. Of course, driver development. That's where most most of us, <clears throat> excuse me, use uh, use use this information. And uh, one of the things that I always try to think of is is the driver reacting to what the vehicle is doing, or is the driver creating the vehicle's reaction? As I've gone out and uh, done work with different teams, I find that to be something that uh, the driver argues one way and the crew argues the other way sometimes. And and of course, it's a critical difference. And uh, and with data, it's very easy to pick out. The driver did a movement with his hands or with his feet, or or, or something, and uh, and then the car reacted to it. Or did the car react, and then the driver was just you know keeping the was the driver just keeping the car underneath him? Those are things that help us figure out. Okay, what's the first thing we go to fix? Is it the car or is it the driver? And then what part of the car or what part of the driver? So those are important things. And one of the things that I try to make sure everybody understands. Uh, one of the large values of data acquisition is problem catching and, and solving of those problems. You know, you know what your typical issues are. Is it oil pressure in the corners? Is it is it alternators that go slowly go bad or you know rear differentials that get soft? You know, what is it that uh, that is the issue? And we can use data to track that and watch that and catch these problems before they get before they take you out of a race. You know, we should be identifying those problems ahead of time. And uh, <clears throat> pardon me, and that uh, that saves money and track time, of course. I caught a real bad cold in the last couple of days, so I'm going to have to take a sip on things every once in a while. Ah, there we go. And then reports. Yeah, you know, we won't spend a lot of time on reports, but but uh, reports are a good way of understanding what uh, what just happened. Keep track of it, and, and and if you work on a team concept where you have some you know some mechanics that are working there, or you know some of the different records and, and reports that we can output really quickly and most of the data systems uh, are great to just walk over to somebody and hand a printout of uh, say a channels report or something like that so we'll talk about that real briefly everybody uh, everybody get that screen that screen is 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 real important go ahead and click on your hand and, and uh, raise your hand if you if you understand what we're talking about there that is that is the key to me to uh, to making data work for you is is understanding what when why reacting or creating and uh, and understanding the difference between that. If you can get to that point, your data you, you're getting good at data, and you're going to make things happen. Perfect. Thanks, everybody. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. I have another theory. I got lots of theories, I guess, but uh, I got another theory, and it's uh, it's called I call them money channels. And in and in the in the data acquisition world, and frankly, in in motorsports. You know, there's two things that are critical: speed and lap times. And to me, the bottom line is at the end of the at the end of the session, if you're if you're trying to look at something, you uh, 
these are the two things that you base most of your decisions on. These are what you look at first. If your speed goes up or down, you, you've, you've done well. If your lap times go down, you're, uh, you're doing well. You have to get these, uh, the speed and the lap times to, to, the speeds to go faster and the lap times to go quicker. That's the goal. The, the, all the other channels, and we have lots of them. You know, some of us have tons, some of you know, may not have that many, but all those other channels are all data about the data. It's metadata. It's, it's, uh, it helps me understand and helps me, you know, determine what happened, when did it happen, why did it happen, and how to make it better. You know, so all of those other channels, be it RPM, gear position, brake pressures, throttle, steering, you know, shock sensors, whatever it happens to be, it's all helping me in my goal of making my, my speed faster and my lap times quicker. So that's uh you know that's kind of the um, the way that I look at data, and that makes it simpler to go in and start looking at speed traces, and then start adding the 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 sensors that I need in order to understand why those went faster or slower. Because if you uh, if your speed gets faster and your lap times get quicker, you are improving, and that's the and that's the bottom line. We have another poll question. Let's let's see. Let's launch this poll. What is your primary goal of your use of data acquisition? You, you may not have thought about it too much, but, but uh, go ahead and answer some of those questions. It's, is it vehicle? Is it driver? Is it problem solving reporting? Or, or all of the above? You know, most people use it, of course, as a, as a tool for one of them primarily. And then, of course, uh, you know, using uh, the other pieces as they see fit. And I see that, uh, you know, we've got about 90, 92% of the folks have voted. And um, let's let that stay open for just another couple of seconds. And that's pretty good. Let's go ahead and close that poll and show it to you. It's kind of what I seen from when I uh, when I looked at some of the information uh, that I got earlier. Driver development is is critical to everybody. Obviously, we all want to try to get better, and and it's a tool that will do that. Uh, vehicle development must be a couple of builders out there that are looking about that, and uh, problem solving and reporting. I'll, I'll hope to change your mind a little bit on that problem solving, but I did ask for the primary goal, and I'm and most of you said all a, a big chunk of you said all of the above. So problem solving is another critical. Uh, critical thing for what we do. Okay, let's go ahead and hide that and get back to the presentation. The uh, now we're going to dig into the into the how. The first few slides here we'll go through fairly quickly. It's hardware and software and uh, we'll jump through that pretty quickly. Sensors. Sensors. I always get the question is uh, you know, what what sensors should I put on my car? And uh, you know, and that's one of those things that, that's hard to hard to answer. And uh, the uh, typical sensors, you know, speed, RPM, oil pressure, water temperature, and of course, lateral Gs. Uh, those are kind of ones that are that are that most everybody will end up having, you know, fairly quickly. And then, uh, you know, and then some more sensors that you might end up, you know, taking a look at is uh, uh, more steering position, throttle that really help understand why those speed and, and, and lap times got faster or, or quicker. Uh, brake pressure, shock positions, longitudinal or vertical Gs, uh, air fuel ratios, GPS, th those kind of things are uh, uh, the, the things that, uh, that I look at, that I like to use. And then uh, you know best what sensors. Uh, what, what, at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, uh, I, I typically will turn that right back around on them and, and, and uh, what do you need to know more about? You know, there's you have to think about that as you're as you're lining up your car and discerning what you want. Some of the examples we're going to give you today is probably going to show you uh, some ideas on on uh, things that I do and uh, and things that can help uh, either on the driver side or on the car side. The, on the you know, Ralph asked the question just a second ago: what what sensors apply to driver and what apply to vehicle performance? Uh, it's certainly a crossover. You know, speed. Obviously, there's a there's you. Know, we have to record what the driver does, but we the payoff is in speed. Certainly, throttle position, steering position, those are those are driver tools. Um, you know, shock positions, you know, uh, air fuel ratio are, are things that are on the car. So, you, but you have to think about what is it that you're after. I'm going to show you a a, a bunch of information from our 2006 uh, runoffs car. That's where I, I use most of my data because that's 
the spec me audit data that I had for, for the most part, and, uh, and some MX5 cup stuff. And one of the things that was really important to me was ride heights. I'm going to show you a, a couple things that are out of the box that, uh, that I had shock sensors on that car on, on, the, on all four wheels, but really only used the fronts. People were looking at that in tech, wondering why we had shock positions, and uh, I didn't care about what the shocks were doing. There, there were spec shock. I, I had not done anything to the shocks. I didn't care, but what I did care about was the ride height, and I had a driver that would scream to me at me like crazy if I got too low on the car because it started to hit the bump stops and started to do funny things. Well, I ended up using shock sensors to put myself right where we were just touching the bump stops in the in the in the one corner that was the susceptible to that. So you're going to see some things that are kind of out of the box and, and, and sensors that may you might think where it was a car thing, but really was a driver thing. So think outside the box. Think about ways to uh, to answer questions that you're looking for, and that's uh, and that's what we're going to try to do today. Get another drink. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on installation, but but um, the um, the uh, you need to determine what you want. Obviously, you need to plan out that install just a little bit. It's not terribly hard, but but if you if you think about you know, certainly the AIM systems and, and maybe some of the other ones, we can expand uh, the systems and we can get we can run a single wire to the back of the car and then split off and have all of our sensors. You know, so we're not running having to run five or six wires to the back to do shock pots and rear end temperatures and, and all these things. We can actually just run one back and then just split off on an expansion unit. Things like that. Just kind of pencil it all out and, and uh, try to keep your wiring to a minimum. You know, minimize that cabling and those connections. You know, take your time. Understand it, what you're after and, and, and th try to think ahead a little bit. When you're actually doing the installation, secure everything well. I've not had sensors go bad you know, very often on our own stuff because we really take some time. And uh, one of the little tricks that I learned that I always wanted to share with everybody here is is when I, you know, I first started installing these things, I'd go through bags of wire ties, right? Because I'd put them on, I'd have to cut them off because I'd need to run another wire or take that wire out, whatever it happens to do. Um, what I started to do is I went to the computer store and I found these computer cable Velcro for, for wire, for, for wrapping up uh, computer wires. And it's just pieces of Velcro. And I just started using that and installing the entire system with just those. And when I got everything exactly where I wanted it, then come back in, wire tie it, and pop off the Velcros and, and put those in my box and, and save them to use them again later. So there's a there's a little bit of a tip there to keep you from having to go through, you know, the extra 100 or 200 uh, wire ties like I always do. Let's talk a little bit about uh, um, some detailed uh, data analysis. This is where we're going to spend the bulk of our time. We got about 55 minutes left, you know, and uh, so we're going to we're just going to talk a, a little bit about, you know, the actual screens. Again, it's not going to be software specific, but it is going to be uh, generic. Uh, and you know, hey, the graph is this shape, and let's throw this other sensor in to understand why the graph was that shape. Those kind of things is what we're going to be talking about. <coughs> Pardon me. But first, and just so you can understand where we're going to go, and 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 I may throw out some terms. I'm gonna I'm gonna hit this real quickly. Is is the user interface itself? Over on the left is where you're going to see the channels of the channels that are available for us. Uh, in the AIM system, you can see that these are depressed just a little bit. And uh, what you need to do in order to turn on a channel like this GPS and MX5 RPM, you just turn those on. That places the channel, the the graph over here. These are the values for all of the channels wherever the cursor is. I think that's pretty universal in uh, in most different data systems. So you've got your uh, what we call the measures and laps toolbar. This is where we can go in and change all sorts of different things, but that's the main function of it. The next one is the uh, oops, I get that right. Uh, the next one is the test laps toolbar. This is just this happens to be three laps, and and the one lap that is highlighted down below here is the lap that we're looking at. If you want to get multiple laps up here, you just have to double click on another lap and we would add a second lap. Uh, or we can just grab this and slide it over and look instead of looking at lap three, we'd be looking at lap four. So that's all that the test laps toolbar does, and I may talk about that as time goes on. We have our just our pull down menus and our icons. I'm not going to talk about any of these at all, but since I was showing you the rest of it, I thought I'd show you these. And we have some specific icons for this particular function to all show up over here. And this is where we're going to spend all of our time. This is the main window. And uh, this is where we're going to be looking uh, for the most part on every slide that we look at from here on. Everybody understand the, the basics of those? Go ahead and, and, uh, and, and hit on your little hand. 
You raise your hand if you understand where we're going to go here. Perfect. Glad to see everybody's still awake. It's, uh, it's, okay, great. Great. Okay, let's go on to the uh, another poll question. And I'm going to ask this question. And let's see. Let's launch that one. What I'm asking here is computer skills. Where, where do you where do you think you are on computer skills? Is this is this some of this intimidating to you? Is it um, is it easy? Are you a rookie? Some experience? Average? Pretty good? Expert? Nobody's seeing these results, by the way, so it's not a not a big deal. And uh, I find myself I, I I play around with computers quite a bit, but I find that they're I am no expert, and uh, and uh, sometimes they beat me up pretty good back. Perfect. We're up there. About 98% of you voted. Very good. Let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and close that and show you what that looked like. Okay. So we got uh, got quite a few experts, and you know, ab above average is is where most people are at. You probably wouldn't be here if you weren't uh, weren't comfy with computers and ready to jump into this technology. So thanks thanks for that. Let's go ahead and get rid of that and get back to the presentation. Okay, one of the questions I've seen a lot in, in, in the registration paperwork and questions that I saw, one of the things that people ask a lot is, okay, I've got this data, I've just done it, I'm all by myself out at the track, what do I, uh, what's, what's a good place to start? Where do, where do I go? And um, the, uh, the, one of the first things that I like to do if I'm working with, for a team that I don't know or uh, uh, somebody's asking, let me, let, me, let me jump back to a question so everybody knows. Uh, Michael asks, what's the colored bar at the top? And that's a good question. Uh, we won't get into it too much here, but I will point it out just so you know. You've got this bar across the top is what uh, Michael's talking about. And uh, what that is is that's the segments that, uh, that when we've broken this, this, this track, this happens to be Portland and, and just outside of uh, uh, Portland International, International Raceway, outside of Portland, Oregon, and uh, you can see that the green segment, and then then each 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 uh, each corner is a different color, you know, red and blue, red and blue. Those are what these what these bars are across there, just so you can see your own segments and how you've broken them up. So that's what uh, that's what that colors are across the top. And uh, does Mike Collins raise his hand? I'm gonna have to look, I'm gonna have to watch that. Stefan asked that. I'll have to keep my eye on that and make sure. The uh, <laughs> a lot of people here know everybody. That's the that's half the problem. But uh, the uh, keeps me laughing when I'm trying to trying to concentrate. So people ask, okay, well, I've got I've got data and it's just my just my own. What what is what is something I can do to help me right off the bat? Uh, or if you're working with a driver, one of the things multiple speed traces just from a single single sample. I just bring up. And, and in this case, you can see I've got one, two, three, four, five, six speed traces. I've only got speed turned on, and I just put six of them in a row. And then we start to look at the trace, and then we start looking for areas where there are um, the uh, differences or, or, or noise in, 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 those, uh, in those traces. And what you'll find is that there, in this particular graph, there might be two that stand out to me. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to highlight one of them here. <clears throat> You notice that there's there's a pretty good difference here, uh, at the end of the straightaway speeds, and then of course that and that translates into some braking differences uh, coming down, and um, so that's an area that that might be an improvement. So when you start to see areas like this, the driver is probably a little bit on edge as well. Now is it the car or the driver? Well, we've got a speed trace here showing us some things, and we would just want to start throwing some more sensors at it. Maybe it's brake pressures. Uh, maybe it's uh, you know, turn in points, maybe it's position on the track, and then figure out why he's struggling here. The other one that we might want to look at is over here. And those of you that have been around Portland, this is the, there's a little bit of a high speed chicane at the end of the back straightaway. And it's, and it's uh, in this particular case, it's, there's some inconsistency, inconsistency here under the braking as you come down, and then you've got braking, and then you've got a, a fairly high speed chicane, you know, at the 85 to 90 mile an hour range. Uh, and then breaking right after it again. Kind of hard to get that segment really right, especially if you're following cars, so uh, some other folks. So, you, yeah, 
we would want to work on it. We'd want to try to get improve and, and get consistent, but that's one. That's a tough combination under braking with a chicane. So that one, uh, you can see there's some pretty good differences there. I'd want to know what happened on that red lap. Why was it so much faster? And then try to do uh, to do even more to 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 help help him get uh, even quicker in that area. Let me read a couple of questions here. Um, <laughs> Uh, segments are they the same as sectors um, different names from different products but yes segments are the, the same as sectors it's uh, like in this particular graph here you know this this is a uh, this is uh, Laguna uh, Mazda Raceway and you've got a green straightaway here with a blue corner those are sectors or segments you know, interchangeable in, in most of the different uh, different softwares so yes uh, the other one was is it uh, are those user defined or software defined um, on the AIM software, and I think most of them, those are when you initially bring up a lap, uh, the software defines them for you. Then you can go in and change them anywhere you want to go. But it, the software I find is a is a builds a pretty darn good, uh, pretty darn good segments uh, out of out of what it is, and we can adjust that fairly easily. So so the software does it, but the but the user can define as well. Is it better to graph mini laps or just the focus laps? The uh, uh, mini laps to me you know and and you, I picked the last five there I tried to pick five in a row when or, or five or six in a row as many as nine and 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 uh, we're talking about the the session the segments before here the uh, I, I try to pick a bunch of them in a row when the driver and the tires and everything else is about at the same spot if you pick them all over the, all over the run you'd have more of it more trouble so um, so I try to pick um, laps right in a row when we are looking at at the outlier areas, can predictive times be used somewhat to better understand what happened? That's from Dave. Um, yes, predictive lap timing, um, theoretical bests, you know, some of those things like that. The the only trouble with that is 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 uh, if depending on where you build your segments and, and and how you build them, sometimes you can kind of cheat the one that you're in and give up a little time on the one afterwards. So the uh, those outlier areas that I, the way I look at it at least those are those are things that are are good to give you an overall view on but not necessarily hang your hat on totally but always look at your best segment and then look at the one after it and if it's still fast then you can probably redo that and, and continue to do that segment so that's that's uh, that's good the um, Chris just asked a good question should we be concentrating on our fast laps or our slower ones when looking for opportunities both, both. Uh, your 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 fast laps are where it's kind of your benchmark, and then you apply your slower laps. What most people will find, and I think you'll be surprised, is even on your slower laps, there's area you are faster than you are on your fast laps. So I use both. I use a combination of a bunch of different things, and and uh, and maybe you have a teammate, and one teammate's quite a bit faster. I use that faster teammate a lot to help the slower guy, but then there is always, there's never been a time yet that. Uh, we haven't been on a team that had some slower drivers that the slower drivers weren't faster in certain areas that, that the fast guys would always pick up on. Um, another great question here. I'm, I don't want to spend too much time keeping going with it, but the great one, is there an easy way to spot changes due to a draft or traffic? E absolutely. Uh, not easy, but, but look in here in the box on number one. Why do you suspect, expect that that blue lap was so much quicker in, in, a, in a spec car you know, this is an MX-5 Cup car. Every lap that was 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 ran was down here within a mile an hour or two, and then there's one that's like five miles an hour higher. Boom! You know, uh, there, there's a reason for that on a long straightaway like Portland. Uh, yes, the draft happens, and, uh, and and you can whenever you have one outlier that's way higher, that's typical. The funny part is 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 more on this one over here where you have um, where you have let me get my little highlighter where you have one lap that's quicker. You probably was drafting, and you'll almost always find that if, unless he gets past the car, that you'll be slower in the resulting brake area. So you can another way to pick up a draft is you're fast up the straightaway, but slow in the braking into it, because you had to follow that car. That if you that you, if you didn't get past it, that's another good way of looking at it. Obviously, video is the is the next tool that would be uh, that we would want to have in in that case and be able to go and look look directly at it. Okay, let's jump ahead. The next one is uh, multiple laps with one driver. So we, we're, we're going to throw in, um, now we're comparing the, these two laps. 
and you'll notice here the lap times up here are 144.3 and a 144.3 with a with a one and a six. So they're they're five hundredths difference between these two laps. But you can tell that there's you know differences in the laps, and 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 uh, what we want to do is find out you know areas of improvement for you know, the driver comparing even against himself. Not everybody out there has teammates that they can share data with. So so in area number one, I, this kind of stood out to me is uh, boy the on the red lap driver got into got into that and was quite a bit faster at the apex but then lost some speed coming off and we and we want to know you know we we know what happened now the speed trace is telling us that there's a uh, that there is a that there is a some speed there at the apex and then coming off all of a sudden loses it i'm going to use this these next four or five slides just to give you an idea of how how we work our way through uh, a, a normal problem and, and solution to getting not only what happened but why and then how to fix it right so number one we've got this the, this this red lap was faster come in the middle and number two is kind of the same thing except for it went farther up the straightaway before it lost some speed and I'd like to know why those two happened I'd love to be able to run that red speed at the apex and hold that speed all the way down the straightaway so that's uh, that's kind of our goal so I got my speed trace. That's that's my money channel, right? And so now I want to know why. Why did this happen? So the first thing we're going to throw up there is uh, is a throttle position trace. So I've clicked on the throttle position trace that took it from over here, threw it up into the main window, and I've told it in this particular case that I wanted it in the lower. You know, I've got one for the upper window. I've got two for the second. We can break this into six. Most of the softwares do the same thing. So now I've got the throttle position down here below, and. Uh, and obviously, the driver was coming through there and had to get off the throttle on the red lap, where the blue lap, he was flat flat all the way out of the corner. So that would account for that, obviously, losing of that speed by having to jump out of the throttle right on the exit. Now, the trouble is is that I'm curious enough now to know, okay, well, he jumped out of the throttle, well, but why? So now, that's good information that he jumped out of it, but, but the next thing would be, why did he have to do that? Let's let's keep on working it, keep on digging in, and uh, let's go to the next slide. And then, uh, so what I've thrown up on top of that now is lateral G's. And uh, so we've got now lateral G's, and you can kind of see what uh, what happens here is 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 you've got your zero G point here. The driver's turned in. Their max G is at you know one and a half or you know little one point four G's or so right here. And you notice that the driver has held the G's longer, and then and then had to throttle out of it. Why do you think, you know, why would he have done that? You know, they're, uh, you know, you you probably think about it, and and uh, but another great tool that we have is the GPS sensor. And now this is this is the Mazda Raceway Laguna Seca turn, uh, you know, one two three. I think it's turn five. I think they call it. And uh, so you he's came in here and. And he missed the apex point probably. Could have been following somebody. You know, you never know on data what the real reason is. But you do have the resulting information here. And sometimes you can dig into the real reason. But you can see here by the blue trace was farther inside on the exit. And on the red one, he was a little bit wide. So either the driver just missed it, was maybe that extra speed slid him out there where he, where he had to really crank the wheel. He had to lift off the throttle or else he would have went off the track here. Uh, when Andrew first started racing... Uh, uh, bandoleros in, in in asphalt circle track stuff. We did a couple of years of that, and one of the things that, uh, that we had to sit down fairly early on, he he would get real close to the wall or have to lift coming off of turn four. But one of the things we had to learn really quickly, and data shows that every time we start playing with it, is this instance of having to get off the throttle way over here and get uh, and and really crank on the wheel was not because of what he did right there. It's because of what he did way back on the entry. So uh, race cars have a, a funny way of paying you back for a, a little tiny error early will we'll screw you up for the rest of this corner and then the resulting straightaway and the next corner after that because it's uphill. And uh, it, it would make you pay all the way, in this particular case, all the way up to the, uh, to, to the corkscrew. And, and especially when you, when, you, when you screw up the next corner as well. So let's go ahead and jump up to the next corner. Everybody see the, the value of GPS for, and, and um, you know, speed, throttle, lateral Gs. Go ahead and raise your hands if you see the value of being able to look not only the line, but also the data to, to point you towards that. That's, uh, that's critical. It's the speed we have is the, is the what happened, and then every other channel that we have available to us 
proves the reasoning why that happened. Because if we don't know to, to, to get Andrew to back off just a touch here in order to hold this or turn in earlier or do a later apex, we end up having a real problem of running off the track and he needs to, you know, we need to understand all of that. So AJ asked a question, is there a way to show the actual track borders? Um, some different softwares actually do that, and uh, uh, I have not found that to be a value to me at all, personally. Uh, yes, there's some curbing there. If I, if if the blue one, if if the red one coming off hits the it hits the hole coming off, or the blue one hits, you know, the major curb curbing on the inside, we can see that with uh, you know lateral G's and and steering position angles and some other things um, to get that actual inside outside line. Number one, it's kind of dangerous to me to go out there and drive around slow enough to get that you know, when other cars are out on the track. And number two, GPS has some inherent issues of of not accuracy when you're making these back-to-back -back laps. These are really quite accurate, but if you you know four or five hours earlier versus what you just ran, your inside-outside line may not be the inside-outside line of when you actually uh, just drove it. It might be a foot or two different. So so you have those those issues there. I find just give me the driving line, and then we can see the see the difference between uh, between what we're doing. Um, Brian asked a question about about uh, uh, accuracy. Uh, the way you, GPS works is, it, is the same satellites come over about every 12 hours. So if you ran today at, at noon and you run tomorrow at noon, you're going to be really quite accurate. But different satellites moving at different rates and different configurations, you, you can get some differences. I do not find that uh, we're more than two or three feet off on, on all the different data systems that I've seen and, and, and use. GPS is GPS, and, and we all have those same kind of issues. Uh, why are we not looking at steering also? Yes, would have, but uh, not everybody has a steering sensor, so I wanted to show this data that would have shown that. I'm going to show you some steering sensor data here in just a moment, just to give you an idea. And Alexander, could he have held the higher line speed, or, or he couldn't because he went wide? Uh, the conclusion was, yes, he ran out of track on the way out and had to get off the throttle, had to turn the wheel harder to stay on the track, to stay on the black stuff. So uh, couldn't hold that speed. If uh, You're going to actually, I think we're going to look at another one where the higher speed around the outside actually did, does work. And uh, those are where data really starts to help is, yes, sometimes that high line actually does does get you, uh, you, know, you roll off the corner so much quicker. So, so uh and the driver doesn't feel that because the driver always wants to drive down to the apex. But sometimes data really helps you figure those things out. Is exit speed a good proxy for a good line? Uh, almost always yes. Uh, but if you if you had to give up so much here early in order to get good exit speed, you have to balance that out. But assuming that your entry speed was was similar, exit speed is is really uh, that's that really is a, a great proxy for what you're what. Does that line work for the car you're with? Danny asked that question. Absolutely, but if you give up too much early, then does, does it really pay off? No. So you got to kind of balance that out just a little bit. Let's go to the next seg section. And the, um, the, the next one is he's pretty fast again at the middle of the corner and then slowly loses that speed going up the straightaway. Let's see if we can figure out why that happened. So this is the next corner. And it's uh, it's down in this area. I, I included the GPS map and the and the normal track map, and uh, and so now we can look at that. And show, we're showing GPS throttle, lateral G's, and the red one gets back on the throttle really early. You see that the throttle position comes up, and they waited a little while on the on the blue lap. And uh, if you kind of look at this, this is this is 200 feet, uh, 5,600, 58, 6,000, 6,200. So that little difference there is is what 35, 40 feet the driver was back on the throttle. All good, but the trouble is, and um, let, let's jump ahead one more slide. Throttle was on here, that's great, but here, here we are on the exit. You see the driver, he lost some lateral G's here. The car probably slid, you know, uh, hit a bump or, or just lost grip a little bit at the apex, you know, at that point, and um, right here at this point, and then all of a sudden the driver had to throw a lot more wheel back at it and built a lot more G's, and when, with, by, and if you look at that, that's that's uh, almost double G's, double the G's at, at this uh, at this one point. I think it was point uh, point five higher at that point right there. When you have a low low horsepower car 
bound up on a on a on a corner such as this this is here where you're when you're in a dip where you're starting uphill and you bind the car up that that badly speed was pretty good right there and it just slowly the blue the blue lap even though he got on the throttle later by not having the car bound up freed up even earlier the, the acceleration rate just slowly overtook and was faster at the end of the straightaway so uh, again it's just a, a great thing to remember that those you know, soft hands we might call it whatever you want to call it but you know sometimes super fast in the middle of the corner does not always pay off if you have to really jerk the wheel and you get the car a little bit crossed up you end up just by binding up the car a little bit to lose speed going up the resulting straightaway. Anybody that's raced at Mazda, Mazda Raceway knows that this, this is a dip and then it starts uphill pretty good. Slow exit speed coming off of that corner will kill you all the way up to the, to the next corner. So, so again, more th throwing more channels at it, seeing that the red lap was a little bit inside, maybe hit that curb a little bit, and that's what released him. We could look at even more data if we wanted to and continue to dig in. Release the car, and all of a sudden it bit hard, and uh, and then lost speed. Everybody, uh, let me put those down. Everybody keeping up with all of that? Everybody can see those graphs, okay? Go ahead and and, uh, and click on your hand if every, if everything is okay. Just so you know, we've got about uh, just a little over thirty minutes. Great, I'm glad everybody can see everything. I was a little worried about uh, the quality of the of the graphs coming through. Okay. Here's one for, uh, I'm going to answer that question. Danny, that, that's a great question, especially at a track like Laguna that we're talking about. The, the track we're going to look at next is, is Topeka. Uh, I think that's Drago's favorite track, if I remember right. But, I, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, how do you account for track elevations and data analysis? The, uh, the, you can. GPS now has the ability that we're, we're getting, I'm not showing it here, but we actually do have, uh, not only our location, but also the slope of the road. And, uh, and, and if you're a mathematician kind of a guy and we're, and we're working, you know, on thinking of ways of, of, of generating things in the software to, to help us even use that more to understand that the car is going uphill, the car is going downhill, and, and using that into, into some of the calculations and such. So um, how do we account for the track elevations, the elevation change? Um, not as much as what... Uh, you know, people need to think about that as, as they're looking at it. Sometimes you'll get an acceleration rate that is not so good, and you're going to think, wow, the, you know, the car is kind of flattening out there. But in reality, it's, uh, it's going uphill. And uh, always keep that in mind when you're looking at things. Same thing on braking distances. And I'm going to talk a little bit about braking here right now. But your uh, braking distances, if you're coming downhill, you've got to take that into effect. If you're at, uh, at Infineon and you're going up into, into turn two and the thing is steeply uphill, you can really woe down a car pretty quickly with not a whole lot of brake pressure. So, yeah, keep that in mind. GPS is a great way of being able to throw a trace up there and show exactly the, the slope of the road to help you with that. So keep, keep that in mind as you're looking at uh, uh, doing data work and using that GPS information for even more than just location. Brake pressure. Let's talk a little bit about brake pressure. This is, this is, this is data from um, uh, our 2006 runoffs. This is the runoffs race uh, data. And uh, so something I wanted to show everybody, a couple things about brakes. The, um, as a driver improvement, driver development tool, you know, at that point, I think Andrew was 19 years old or something like that. He didn't start heel and towing until about four months before the, before the runoffs. Pardon me. And um, so what we were looking at is, is during that race, and we didn't want to change a whole lot because – it was just not the right time to, to be changing a ton of what he was doing. But, but inside this box right here, we've got um, the, uh, you'll notice that we've got brake pressures down here on the bottom one. And it's kind of shown over here with this channel tag. Brake pressures, throttle position, and speed. And here he stepped on the brakes at the end of the front straightaway uh, for, in, in, this, in this case, the turn one. And, uh, and you can see where he blips the throttle here with these two black raised right throttle position traces going up right here and blipping the throttle and he went to brake pressure and he was probably at 600 psi or something as soon as he started blipping the throttle we started to lose brake pressure and you can and and let's go to the next slide just to show you kind of the payoff of that I, i'm going to zoom in a little bit this is that same area but just zoomed in a little bit more and um the now you can see he hits the brakes and it's at about 600 psi here right about there and then he blips the, blips the throttle and it starts to lose brake pressure as he's using more of his foot on the throttle. 
And you can kind of see here, if I click on another one, in this area, blip, blip, throttle brake pressure is going down. And then let's draw a box here, that you, and, and your eye has to kind of catch this, but but you can see that the, the deceleration rate is pretty good. And then you see how it starts getting closer to the red line at the top? Raise your hand if you can kind of pick that up real quickly. <coughs> Pardon me. Yeah, everybody can pretty much see that the braking was going along well, deceleration was happening well. You can see that on a speed trace. You don't necessarily need brake pressure. And then all of a sudden, it starts to relax a little bit. And that's where he's relaxing his foot on the brake while doing his downshifts. And then... Then the you know, again a, a, a cascading effect in, in race cars. It's just the way things happen. It, nothing is done in a vacuum in a race car. Then what you see now I've thrown in longitudinal G, so I've got a sensor here that is actually showing me kind of the same thing. He's he's got a lot of negative G's in the braking zone, and then he kind of went flat and in fact raised up a little bit here where where we've seen it in the speed trace and we see it in the in the brake pressures. So all three are showing us the same thing. You don't necessarily have to have every every uh, you know sensor available to man to see these things but they obviously help and um, so you, you see these things happening and then the next screen I think this one here happens and, and this is that cascading effect of things that happen and he uh, his lateral G's all of a sudden he this big drop off what is there what do you think that happens here this is a speed trace this the speed trace is hooked to the drive line typical spec me auto way of doing things, I suppose, at least at the time. And all of a sudden, the rear tires lock up. And because he left some braking on the table here, and then all of a sudden, he starts to turn in. Now, this is lateral Gs. So he's turned the steering wheel, and he's starting to build Gs to turn into the corner as he's coming up here. And all of a sudden, it locks up the rear tire on the inside, you know, the rear tire. So he, because he's gotten back after the brakes right here really hard, back to where he was when he first started before the downshifts, for the two blips of the throttle, he gets back after the brakes again to woe it down just as he's turning in, and it locks up the rear tire, rear inside tire. Typical spec Miata, I suppose. And uh, so then all of a sudden he has to drop off the brakes real early, you know, really quickly, to, to try to capture and, and not lock up that inside tire, and reduce his turn in a little bit to cap, you know, get get that tire back planted again. And uh, and and that probably happened because his eye told him he could stop, and his reaction was that he could stop, but because of the reduction in brake pressure right here, he ended up having to really woe it down hard at turn in and do a little trail braking, which locked up the inside tire. In this particular case, on these type of cars, you really need to, to get your braking done a little bit more in straight line and then trail braking a little bit, but reducing that brake pressure. Um, Chris asked the question, does brake pressure tell you any more than longitudinal Gs in terms of driver development? Yes and no. I hate to always come up with those kind of answers, but uh, brake pressure is is critical in certain things. But when you drop off of a hill, let's say, or that turn three at uh, Infineon where you're breaking uphill, the uh, the deceleration values are 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 oops are uh, are important because that's what the the car can take not necessarily what the brake pressure is. The brake pressure is is what the driver can give the car and, and, and take it up to maximum it'll take. It might be 800 foot PSI in one corner and it might be 300 in the next. So brake pressure is one of those moving targets, but deceleration rates should be fairly, you know, fairly constant, unless you're really downhill, off camber, whatever it happens to be. None of them are perfect. You gotta, you gotta throw in track conditions and, uh, and, and other things. Keep in mind too that uh, some of you that were at 2006 runoffs the early part of this race was the track was wet, and things like this were going to happen a little bit earlier. As he, as you got farther into the race, you're going to, you know, the track got drier, and uh, and and some of these things went away. But but this was something that we found pretty quickly, and was an area of driver improvement. And while we're looking at longitudinal G's and brake pressures and other things, it really was his right foot and the and the and the and the uh, and the heel and towing that was kind of affecting his braking. So we just had to fix that. And a little bit of practice and him knowing that he was doing it and fixing it. And now, and now his brake traces go up, they go flat, and they come down. And you at maximum brake the entire time. So that's, so that's good. The, uh, I don't think so. Jamie, Jamie asked, can we keep going for another couple of hours? I don't think that that will work well. Uh, I am going to hang around for, for, for a while afterwards, so don't worry about that. Uh, we're down to about 25 minutes, but I want to officially end it at that point, though. Um, 
what's the new way to connect the speed trace? This is from John. What is the new way to connect the speed trace to a spec Miata? You mentioned the old way. Other people do it in different ways. I, I happen to be, it was easy to get to the drive line. That was what I wanted. If I was doing it again today, I would, uh, knowing what I know now and knowing what things I, I would want to know, I would want, I'd probably put two speed traces and I would put one on each side of the differential. And I would want to know uh, what that differential is doing. I'd like to know when it goes soft, when things are happening, when the tires are spinning. That's what I would call the new way, uh, or a front tire. Uh, with GPS, we've got a good speed there, and we can always compare. And uh, so we can bring uh, a GPS speed versus a versus a, both rear tires on a, on a spec Miata. That's how I would do it. I would have two speed sensors, hard speed sensors, hard, you know, true sensors, not GPS, but true sensors, one on each side of the differential. And let's go to the next one. I've already seen that one. Understeer, oversteer. This is something that a, a lot of people want to know about, and I, I've seen this probably from 10 or 15 folks. Uh, let me get a raise of hands on that braking thing. Everybody understand where we were at with that? That's, that's, uh, that's one of those kind of outside-the-box things. More, most people would not look at a brake pressure sensor and, and, and look at it as a driver training tool for his right foot, if you know what I mean. I, I like to show people different ways of thinking outside the box. I'm glad uh, I'm glad all of you are seeing that. So, thank you very much. Understeer, oversteer. Of course, we have to have a steering position sensor, and uh, uh, Mike Collins asked a question. Oops, I've been only using first names. Mike just asked a question. If you do the axles, how sensitive is the tire circumference? The, you know what, Mike? The way that I look at that is is uh, I don't care if one's reading 80 miles an hour and one's reading 78. Okay, yeah, when they're two miles an hour off, I've, I've messed up on my circumference just a little bit. What I'm looking for is the difference. And when I go through the turn, a high-speed corner and then flat to the floor, and if one goes up and the other one doesn't, that's what I'm after. I'm after what's happening with that differential. That's how my mind is working right now if I was racing spec me out. I'd like, I want to know what when things are working correctly down there. And that's so, w in, 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 at the end of the day, I want my circumference to be right. I'm going to find my longest straightaway, and I'm going to try to find an area, and I'm going to, down the straightaway, I'm going to adjust my circumference till I get that thing where it's reading correctly on both sides. And then, yeah, the outside tire, you know, may well be a little bit quicker just by, by, the, by the effective radius of the corner. It's driving farther, obviously. But, uh, but also that inside tire is, is probably lit up just a little bit. It's probably spinning a little bit. So those are things that I'd want to know. If, if, if I'm running uh, certain corners, uh, the corner I'm going to work on here, I think, in a little bit is this, is the, one, the corner we struggled with the most and other folks struggled with was this, uh, this turn three at Topeka. And that one there, we would, we would get this understeer, oversteer stuff going on in that corner. And that's where we fought or fought. We, that's where we worked hard to make sure our car was good in that corner. And, uh, and, uh, and that's where I would like to know what that differential was doing. So <laughs> I hated that one too. Yeah, I hear you. What I found here, let's, let's talk a little bit about, uh, um, uh, Mike also said, I saw several people at the runoff circumference matching tires. In a perfect world, absolutely. Think about what we just looked at on that uh, turn five or whatever at the Laguna where you jerked the wheel just that little bit and then you added just a little bit of bind to the car. And now you add a, you know, a tire that's uh, <coughs> not quite matched the other one. I, when we were racing Spec Miata, the rear two tires, I would, I would air them up and I would mount those two. Those two were the ones that, were, uh, that I ran a tape around and I got those as close as I could get. Uh, just because straight away, you know, rolling resistance, you know, there's something happening there. I would want to to uh, make sure that's as matched up as I can. Let's move on to under and oversteer. I was digging through uh, Andrew's 2006 Spec Miata data from the from the runoffs, and I found I wanted to find a, a neutral corner, I wanted to find an understeering corner, and I wanted to find an oversteer corner. And darned if I found in one segment here. Uh, over here in what is this uh, six, seven, eight? I don't know what those corners were called, but over in this area, I found three corners in a row that each the car was doing three different things. Remember, the track was wet, and of course, it's going to do some weird things. That, but on these particular three corners, I've got I've got understeer, oversteer, and neutral. Let's start with a neutral. What a, what a neutral corner looks like when you have these sensors. Let's talk about what sensors I have hooked up here. Uh, lateral G's is this black one, 
And uh, and the red one down below it here is steering. You can kind of keep this in mind if you look read up here on the channel tags. The above on the top side, I have my speed, and I have throttle position. This is my go-to set of graphs when I first start looking at a car that has steering sensor data, lateral Gs. This is this is what I go to. This is what I save as a view when it comes to looking at the overall balance of the car. These are the four sensors I use. Then I dig in a little bit deeper. So now I've got, and this, this is a perfectly neutral corner. I've got my steering position going one direction. If you throw a steering wheel at it, you should build Gs. And it's, it's funny how it always works out. When you scale these things, uh, and I go 180 to 180 on the steering, and I go, you know, uh, two Gs to two Gs, and it, and it works out pretty well. And uh, so I throw a steering wheel at it, and it builds Gs. It's almost a mirrored opposite, you know, uh, effect. Some people like to flip these things and actually go the other way where they're laid right on top of each other. That's up to you. However, you, whatever works for you. To me, my eye works better if I if I see this as uh, equal and opposites amount. So Andrew threw steering wheel at it. It built Gs. It basically mirrors but opposite and comes back together. That's a neutral corner. Let's jump to the next one. This one is an understeery corner. Can everybody show me a show of hands if you can look at that real quickly and pick out the understeer on that? Just real quickly with your eye. That it should show up fairly quickly to you if you know the basics of what you're looking for. I get about half of you looking for it. Let's let's point it out real quick. And uh, the uh, kind of the bottom line with this is is he started to throw a steering wheel at it. He was not. He was a little abrupt. He threw a bunch of wheel at it, which probably got the thing a little bit, a little bit loose going in, and then all of a sudden, it, the G's have stopped building, but he threw a bunch of wheel at it right here, okay? And this is right near, and the driver is always going to do this. I mean, the driver always wants more. That's their job is to go as fast as they can, right? So the driver was coming down right here to the apex, and he noticed that he probably was off by a foot or two, and he wanted to get get the car closer to the apex, so he threw some more wheel at it. Trouble is, is either wet or he was already at max G's or, you know, there's all sorts of different things that we could look at. But but uh, he threw more wheel at it. The car did not react. So inside the car, the driver is going to be going, especially my driver, is going to be on the radio probably right about here complaining about the push. But <laughs> uh, you're going to turn in, and if it turns more, he's just going to know immediately the, uh, that, the, that he asked for more and it didn't give it to him. There, there's lots of good reasons why it didn't, but uh, I wanted more. It didn't give it. Classic under, classic understeer right here. Are the wiggles, Keith asks, are the wiggles in the G noise or real acceleration differences? When you see, that's a great question, and, and you're you're going to see this corner has a little bit of the noise, right? But not too much. This one here, there's there's more of it. What I have found, and 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 I and I'm, you're, you're going to see a lot more noise in in the trace when you're when you're G'd up hard, but it's also the tires are rolling. There's all sorts of things going, and the car is is right on the edge, and it's and it's slipping and gripping, slipping and gripping, and you're going to see some of those. The more of those that you see, the closer the car is to the to the edge, of of uh, of losing control. So the yes, no, those wiggles in the G's are there is some G noise, but it's also uh, there is some some um, some real things to that. The uh, so big understeer right here in the middle of that corner. By the way, what does everybody think that is right there? That that one gets a few people right at first, but they uh, that in a spec Miata with the way that the drive line is is when he shifts, there's a big old uh, the speed trace it wraps up, and uh, so yes, that is a shift point, and you can see that pretty pretty quickly, and you'll see those at every shift point. Even if I didn't have throttle position up. We'd have known that was a shift point, so just to give you an idea. Okay. Did you filter the lateral Gs, or is it raw? These are raw numbers. I I am not a fan of filtering virtually any channel unless it's just junk, and uh, I like to leave these. <coughs> pardon me again. I like to leave these fairly uh, fairly raw values. Those of you that have GPS-based systems, uh, whether it be AIM or not, the uh, the GPS that derived lateral and uh, longitudinal Gs look a lot more filtered and uh, because they're being calculated. And you can actually see uh, uh, these, these, these marks won't quite be there, but you're also then losing some, some of the ability to see some other things in that data. You know, there, there might be a curb that he hit, you know, uh, 
the exit curbing, you know, so there's things you can kind of pick up in certain spots. And, uh, and I like to have the, a good raw value and the GPS values personally for both. Okay, the next, the next box, uh, oversteer. Can everybody see the, uh, can everybody see the oversteer real quickly? Show, give me a show of hands if you can see the oversteer. Understeer, oversteer on these cars uh, in data is not that hard to do. A lot of people think that it's difficult, but to see it is one thing, and then to figure out why it happened is the next. Thanks, everybody. The next one is, uh, you know, why did it happen? You know, um, he's going along here. He threw wheel at it. It built up G's. You can see he released the wheel a little bit here. It released G's. The car is fairly neutral, fairly balanced. It's it's right on the edge in this in this entire corner. And it's holding there. He's reducing some steering, so it has a little bit of a uh, little bit of oversteer, which is just just Andrew's style. That's what he wants. Always uh, just a little bit a uh, little bit loose. So the car was really good that day. And then all of a sudden, boom! He has to throw a bunch of opposite. He's all the way back. To, here's your zero in your steering. He's back to zero. What happened at the same time? If we just go up, I've given you enough data to figure out that right there is where he goes after the throttle. His job, of course, is to get as fast as he can, exit speed as fast as he can. He jumped on the throttle. It went over steer. He caught it, came back, and then uh, and then it went over steer again towards the end. But he never had to lift. He was able to drive through it, as you can tell. And then this was a this was a miss shift, actually, ironically enough, as I dug in through the data. This was a normal shift point, but he he went to shift, missed it, had to had to blip the throttle twice to get the get the thing to shift on the fifth lap of the runoff side, so I'd have to have a talk with him. So, but, uh, so, so uh, that was just a misshift. But you can see that the, uh, the car was loose coming off, again, wet track, uh, some different things, and driving it hard. That, that was what his job was. So everybody can see the oversteer. Uh, I, uh, kind of cool that I found, uh, I didn't have to change a bunch of slides. Neutral corner, understeer, more steering than what the Gs are showing. Oversteer, Gs, less steering than what the Gs are showing. And then the big thing is to figure out why did it happen. Is this something we would fix on the car to fix that oversteer? No. I mean, it, he's driving as hard as he can. He got off the throttle. It broke loose. That's just his job is to get the most out of it as he can. And a little bit of oversteer off is not a big deal. Let me see a show of hands if you, if you get the oversteer under part, understeer part. <laughs> Great. Okay, let's go to the next slide, which is another poll question. Let's launch that poll question. What I'm showing here is, uh, after seeing some of these examples, if you don't already have them, would steering, brake, brake pressures, longitudinal Gs, GPS sensors, are those, those things that you would that you would already want? Would you want? Uh, I'm hoping to open your eyes and and uh, and saying, hey, you know this stuff isn't that difficult to read. This, if you have the right sensor and you understand the basics of how to read it, you you can uh, we can use it and uh, and get good information really quickly. I'm going to close that poll and I'm going to show it share it with everybody. It's kind of what I thought I would see. Ninety-one percent of you said, you know, holy cow, that isn't uh, that isn't so hard to do, and you know maybe I ought to think about. Uh, Getting a sensor like that, that might be good. Okay, let's jump out of that. Perfect. Here, this is the one I, I mentioned a little bit earlier. This is one of those slides that I don't know the state of spec Miatas or, or some of the other classes now as much. We went into the to the Mustangs, which we actually ran into the same exact problem. My guess is production-based cars, when you get them down so low that the you know, weird things start to happen. Ran into the same thing with the MX-5, so I use the same theory all the way through the spec production car, base car stuff we did. This is a very uh, weird way of doing ride heights on a uh, on a spec Miata. And um, um, Ben asked a question back on this on the steering: Is there an advantage for steering column, a rotary type pot, or a or a steering rack string type pot sensor? Uh, no, frankly, uh, I, I'm I'm okay either way, and 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 the reason is. Is, uh, is it really comes down to what's easier to mount. Our spec Miata basically had, did have a rotary sensor right down at the, where this, the, the shaft comes out of the steering box, and it was a rotary with a cogged belt. Uh, every other car I've ran since until the off-road trucks, which can't take string pots, they just tear them up, uh, has been string pots, and we just wrap them around the, uh, the steering shaft. Uh, 
and uh, very easy to mount. They're always tucked up away where they're, they're not getting broke all the time. A uh, string pot mounted up away is, is really handy. So, uh, but in reality, at the end of the day, when you when you uh, when you configure these things and you and you and you tell it, hey, at this point I'm 180 degrees right, I'm straight up, I'm 180 degrees to the left. It doesn't matter how the sensor is, you're going to get the right kind of data. So, so it really comes down to uh, uh, cost and ease of mounting uh, on the steering sensor itself. Um, normal rotary pots are quite a bit cheaper than string pots. Uh, you'd have to talk with your, your local dealer, but probably in the effect of maybe 30. 25, 30 percent. Uh, a rotary pot is probably 25, 30 percent of what a string pot, a good string pot, costs. So, give you an idea. Um, ride height on a Spec Miata. Again, I showed up at uh, at Topeka and I had shock position sensors. I had them on the rear and the front, and in the end, I we, we didn't even run the rears. I did I didn't care. Um, Rake was a big thing to us, but I but that was our small that was our, our minor adjustment. But the front that was where we we keyed everything off the front. That was the way we were thinking at the time. I'm not sure if it's still true or not, but that's where we were. And and, and uh, I, if I drop the car down to get more camber to get the thing to turn correctly, I drop 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 to get more front bite, and then all of a sudden Andrew'd get on the radio after about the third corner and said, "You're too low." You know, oh my gosh, we're in trouble. This thing is a this thing's a handful, and uh, I wanted a way to solve that problem. I wanted to solve it quickly, and then be able to track it. And the the, the sensor, the the front uh, suspension pots were the way that I did it. What we did is I set it at zero at ride height. We put it on our scale pads. We get the car set up where we wanted it, and I would zero it out at a certain height, and then I would start working with it. And the uh, and what we found when we were in the shop back before we left was 0.45 on the right front, and the right front was the one I was keying on because it was Topeka, but it, you want to go somewhere else, different numbers. But 0.45 on the way that I mounted our shock pots is where the, 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 the car touched the bump stops. So what we ended up doing is watching that and being careful and, uh, and keeping that car only hitting that, that 0.45 or above, and I did turn on an alarm here. So if this value ever went above 4.5 where I have the cursor, this red lights up. And you can uh, and you can see exactly when and where it's hitting. You could also just look across here and, and see how close we were to that 0.45. And this is this is the two laps from the end of the runoffs. <coughs> Pardon me. And uh, and you can see that you know that at that critical turn three, where where it would always hit and stay on it. You know, we hit it in the, in the, in the, we're talking about. Uh, under compression, or when it's bottoming out, when it's when the tire's coming all the way up in the fender. Somebody asked that question, and uh, uh, up here is that. Down here is the. If you look at this closely, that's the left. We're we're in a left hand long left hand corner. The right side is packed up, and the left side is dropped out. So minus is when the tire is in is in rebound, and and a positive number is when the car when the tire is in compression. So the uh, so it's compressed up in the into the fender well, just touching at that point and then releases off of it the rest of the corner. If I touched that thing hard and ran it through all the way through the corner, the car would become very unstable uh, for him for whatever reason. So uh, we, we did everything we could and the way that we did it was with front shock pots and uh, under, to understand exactly where that car was. Give me a show of hands if you understand what we were trying to do there. Perfect. Thanks. And it, and it was very effective by the way and it um, uh, understanding exactly what we were after. Brian asked, how did you know that the 0.45, we did a lot of work is how we knew that. We, we, uh, we set the car up on the scale pads on the flat stuff at the, at the shop and then, uh, and then pulled springs out and we put the thing on the bump stops and, uh, and, and we knew what those numbers were and we knew when we touched them and we knew when they were compressed. So Brian, that's how we, that's how we picked up the 0.45. If you didn't do that, you can actually go to the track drive the thing, go out low, and you're going to see where these, if I were to use it a lot, these numbers would have come up and they would flatline when it was sitting on the bump stops hard. You could have picked out the compressed bump stop area by doing that. I didn't want to take that much time. I'm telling you, we went to the runoffs in 2006, and one session, one practice session, I didn't touch my uh, my front ride heights, the rest of, and God knows we're there for a week and a half or whatever it is, right? And uh, we didn't touch the front of the car the rest of the time. We worked up and down on the back to get the rake of how we wanted it to get the balance of the car. That's all we did, and it was all because of this. This made my life way easier on the front end of the car. So uh, another strange way of doing things, but that's 
that's the kind of stuff I want you to walk away from here thinking about when it comes time to uh, think about sensors. I want you to think of ways you've got an engineering problem, you've got an issue you want to try to resolve. Uh, I want to know, is my radiator effective? I want to know, is my water pump, am I losing pressure on this side of the radiator versus that side of the radiator? Put two pressure sensors in it and, and, and go test them just a little bit. And you're going to know real quickly what you got. Those are things that uh, I want you to think outside the box. It's not just a tool for going faster. It's a great tool for going faster, but it's not just for that. So, so keep that in mind. Um, here's another interesting one that I was going to work on, and we ended up getting out of Spec Miata and going to the MX-5. Only got just about five, three, three and a half minutes or so to go. Um, uh, this is one of the ones I was going to work on a ton, but we ended up getting out of Spec Miata. I've never shared this with a bunch of people before, but uh, people may have solved this already. I do not know. Brake pad knockback uh, on the spec mount. This, again, is Topeka. This is um, a brake pressure sensor here with the black trace. Speed, just to, because it's there. I've got my right and front left suspension uh, sensors showing here. And then I've got lateral Gs. Uh, just enough channels to kind of look at this. What I ended up with, a bunch, not that I'm just zoomed in on one, but, but I ended up with a bunch of these little hits. And they look little until I put my cursor on it, and you come up there and you notice that there's back pressure into the system of almost 62 psi. And uh, and then you notice that it's right on the exit of a corner. There's the apex. He's coming off. You know, there's uh, he's still turning pretty hard. The, the separation of the front, right front, left front suspension tells you that he's still loaded up pretty hard. I, I'm not showing you. Uh, lateral Gs are showing you that we're at 1.2 Gs uh, coming off that hard uh, left-hander right there. And then all of a sudden, there's this big spike in the right front tire. There probably was a hole there. I, some of you guys that raced there probably would know what, what was there. He hit a curb, hit a hole, something. But every time he did that, not every time, but most of the times when he'd do something like that, I would get this back pressure into the system. You guys tell me. I, what I was going to work on was trying to make this where, where when I get 61 PSI into my system, that tells me, yes, that, it compressed that one pad because of the, 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 the bearing slop or whatever in the, in the hubs, but it also put 61 PSI into the other three tires, and it probably collapsed and touched the brake pads on the other three. If I was going to be still working in the Spec Miata world, I would have worked on this. So another outside the box, here's a brake pressure, here's what, here's what the driver did, but uh, here's what the driver did, but this was something was something I could work on. I'd work on Andrew on this, this, this dropping off of brake pressure. We could work on that, but this was something I could work on. Um, I see somebody here said, huge problem, cost me, a, cost me a race at the runoffs this year. Um, so I'm not so worried about knockback. Andrew, the driver, is, is certainly uh, concerned about it for the next corner, but I'm telling you that knockback, when it happened exiting this corner, went into slowing the car down, getting onto that straightaway right here, in my opinion. I'm not 100% sure, but I'd, I'd have to look at it real closely. I didn't end up solving it. Steve asked the question, what would you have done to correct it? I would have looked at ways of keeping those pads where they belong, doing doing some different things, whatever I had to do to try to solve it. I didn't have a plan for it, Steve, at this point, but but I, I, I knew I had a problem. I'd have talked to smarter people than me, and I would have figured out uh, mechanically how to, to hopefully do something. Maybe it's even tightening up the bearings and getting, you know, getting the, the thing to stop wobbling even as much as it did. Maybe it wasn't even a brake problem. Maybe it was a, a, a wheel bearing issue to stop it from doing it. I don't know that for sure. But this was something that, that uh, was kind of key to me if I was going to continue to go. Everybody see that? Uh, show me a show of hands if, if, if that interests you. And just another way of looking at data. Just another way. You got to dig into these things. This is this is where the your you or your data guy can really help solve you solve some problems for you. We're pretty much out of time. I'm going to jump uh, to uh, just I think I've only got a couple of slides left. I think I did pretty good. One of the problem solving sides. I, I went through three different levels. Now we're into the problem solving side. I had to, this is a bit of a stretch. I will admit, but uh, this is that uh, this is Topeka. This is the same race. Uh, X Y plots. We can plot. Uh, oil pressure versus g-forces, lateral g-forces, on the two different axes, and um, you know across the x-axis on the bottom I've got g's, and I've got negative g's are left-hand corners, and right and positive g's are right-hand corners, and you can kind of see here, and I'll draw a box around it. You can kind of see that see how there's more dots over here at the 1.2 g range, 
uh, where the pressure is getting down into the 20, 26, 20, you know, 30s range. And um, that's not happening so much on the right-hand corners. Eh, isn't enough for me to worry about? Probably not, but maybe. But uh, I wanted to show just another way of picking out issues that, uh, um, <coughs> pardon me, issues that show that the low oil pressure in left-hand corners might be something we want to look at uh, uh, trying to resolve. So just wanted to show another way of looking at data. You know, it's not a, it's not a normal uh, trace, but it's, uh, it's just a way of looking at information. Everybody, uh, everybody see that? Perfect. Okay. Um, the guys that built our motors for that race, I, I was a little bit freaked out. The, you know, 40, 45 pounds of pressure was the, was the maximum we had. They wanted to lower the oil pressure to get more horsepower. And, and uh, I thought it was a little low, but it, it made it through the day. So. Okay, just a couple slides left. Channel report, this is, uh, AIM offers this, what we call a channel report. Other ones do kind of the same thing. You can pick up, um, this is user definable. Let me jump ahead. User definable, many channel values for every lap. In this particular case, it's every lap of that race. Here's the lap times. Here's the distance the car traveled. Here is the uh, uh, maximum speed for every lap. Remember, it was wet at first and got drier. Uh, lateral G's, you can see the, the max, you know, the, the, the highest minimum value, the highest on the negative, highest on the positive. My average throttle position, something that we kind of watch just to kind of go. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, Jim, I bet. Uh, the uh, brake pressures, uh, the maximum brake pressures that he would see uh, for each lap. Oil pressure minimums, uh, they stayed pretty true all the way through, not a big deal. This one was interesting to me. I, I like to show this particular graph, and I'd like to show you that you look for trends when you start looking at things like this. And um, that right front suspension in that turn three, look at, it's red because I've got an alarm. Remember, I had it turned. If it was above 0.45, it, it turned, yeah, above a certain number, it went red, right? It, uh, 4, 3, 4, 1, 4, 3, 3, there's a 5. It must have rounded down. Uh, black until the track dried out and then he starts laying into that right front tire in that turn three and uh, the uh, started laying into it so you can see when the track dried out and started where he could really get some you know some good some good speed in that one uh, in that one corner so kind of interesting left front suspension was never even close there was a 50 where he must have hit a curb or something right but but uh, but uh, the left front just uh, not loaded at Topeka as much and it wasn't as, nearly as critical Channel report, just a great way uh, of looking at trends at every piece you want. This is one of those things that we print out and hand to if we have a mechanic or a team manager. We hand those really quickly over to that guy, and he can look through there real quick and say, hey, my, uh, my minimum oil pressure never got below 20, and, and I'm okay with that. Boom, let's, let's not worry about oil. Let's keep working on other things. This gives the, everybody a really quick chance of looking at uh, can those channels be broken down into segments, Dave asks, or just complete laps? Yes, they can be broken down into segments, actually. Uh, we have to, there's an there's a options button over on the side. You can actually break down that into, if you remember, we had those, those uh, red and green and, and uh, uh, segments across the top. We can break those down into each one of those segments as well. It becomes a very large report, by the way, so you've got to be kind of careful. Um, he was fastest on the last... On the last, he traveled the shortest distance. The uh, yeah, this is the shortest distance, two one eight, two two two. Yeah, this distance thing, uh, GPS. Now that we've got G this car did not have GPS on it at the time. This was nothing but a rollout distance. So if he was locking up things or doing some weird things, especially early when the rain, uh, when it was still a little wet, you would get some goofy numbers. But those are pretty consistent. You'll, that's that's not too bad. Now that we've got GPS, those numbers are even better. That that becomes something you can actually use to uh, to help on your um, on your driving line. So the uh, and the two hundred eight four being the last lap, he had a bit of a lead, but about this about this spot uh, on the on the next to the last lap, I told him that uh, Rampelberg had turned a faster lap, so he actually went out and went fast, so he could have fast lap of the race. That's no joke, I, and I and I and I and I give him crap about that. What do you what are you thinking? But he wanted fast lap, so that's what he did. Let's jump to the next, and I think last one. The um, uh, in my reports, in, in, I got some information. I know we are just a touch long, about five minutes long, but and, uh, I apologize for that. But we're almost done. The um, uh, a couple guys mentioned that they wanted to output to Excel. 
data systems in general. And, and um, I think most of them do it. AIM certainly does. You can bring up this screen here and we can ask what channels do you want? engine and, and speed and I told it I want all of the laps I want them based on time and I want them 10 samples per second 10 Hertz so I wanted a speed and an engine RPM and a speed every tenth of a second throughout the entire lap and every lap I wanted an Excel spreadsheet and uh, and uh, so then I clicked on it and saved it and and this is what you I'm, I'm quite a ways down the report I want it went towards the end of the next to the last lap but uh, the lap was a 208. This is the lap number at 0, 0.0. In other words, right when he passed the start of the beacon, his engine was at 5236, and he was at 62 miles an hour. Every tenth of a second, it gives you another RPM and another mile per hour. So you uh, you end up with um, um, something you can take with Excel, do more work with it, take it into other programs, do whatever you want. So so we do have that option as well. <coughs> Pardon me. And I think. One more poll question, and then I think we're, uh, oops, I don't want to do that. I wanted to hide that. Let's do uh, one more. And I think I already got this answer, but I'm going to go ahead and ask you this question. Reporting functions. Uh, are they important to you at all? I just showed you a couple of quick ones. Um, they... I think they're 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 pretty well underused. So I, I just wanted to throw that out there and, and have everybody take a look at it. Those are just different ways of uh, when I work with some teams where I end up doing, you know, five, six, seven cars. You know, I can't sit there and talk to every mechanic. I have to re print out that channel report and hand it to uh, to the to the crew chief on that car. Others, if you're doing all your own work, you're the driver, you're the you're the crew chief, you're the owner, and you and you're looking at the data. Yeah, you're getting the information you want already. So. So uh, not so bad there. Okay, let's go ahead and close that poll. Those are some surprising answers to me. Let me share those with you. The uh, uh, yes, 58, uh, not sure, 40, and and I'm glad to see that 2% say, you know, uh, are, are know that, uh, you know, not, not a big deal. Again, if I was all by myself and I'm just looking at the data and moving on, would re reporting be that important? Probably not either. So I'm okay with that. Here's kind of the closing slide, and and, and uh, I want you to, to think about this as as we're as we're heading out the door here. But uh, data is great, but you still need to understand and uh, understand that data and interpret it correctly. There, uh, we did some things. I did some things in the in the interest of of uh, of, of a demonstration here and a, and a talk, where we just looked at one lap and we made calls. And okay, yeah, I would uh, I would raise the car, I would lower the car, whatever it happens to be. In reality, the bottom line is, is you always look for trends in data. Rarely will you take one lap and say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise the car because the car bottomed out there and you only looked in one corner. Always bring up three or four laps. Always look for trends. You don't, you don't want to go down the wrong road really quickly. Um, sadly, there's not a button that tells you what springs or, or what to run on tire pressures. You know, me and Mike, we seem to have trouble with tire pressures. I, I know I do, but uh, the, there's not a button that tells us what to set those are, sadly. And um, uh, but you're still in charge. You have this now. You have you'll have this data. Most of you have it already. You're still in charge. You you still look at it. You you just use this. It's another tool in the toolbox. You still make all those decisions just with more accurate information and data. And um, and, and 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 you move forward with that. So um, I'm going to answer a few more questions as we're going. I wanted to throw this slide up just so everybody has some contact information. Uh, again, I'm Roger Cadell. Roger at aimsports.com is how you can get a hold of me. Uh, I'm uh, so earlier on somebody asked how can we get training from you that uh, I don't do that as much anymore but what I can tell you is is part of my job as the training manager for aim is to go and uh, set up seminars and uh, and we come in and we go come to a, a race shop or a club we have to get 20 25 people that are interested in data and then uh, and then I will come and give a seminar so uh, if you have a group of people that you can get together uh, give me a holler, drop me an email, and uh, and and we'll put something together and come to your area. Uh, very economical for the shops. It's uh, AIM takes care of the, the bulk of the of, of all of that, so not a big deal. Um, how do you know when to go up or down with spring rates versus shock adjustments? Uh, Barry asked that question. Uh, frankly, I'm there. There are lots of different ways mathematically to get to that. Very very in depth, but I will tell you that the classes that we've ran in, that I have done a lot of data work in, uh, spec spring, spec shocks. So I haven't done a ton of that, but uh, 
just always keep in mind that springs springs do certain things and shock adjustments do other things and one controls the other and um, so really you, you can separate that out we have a suspension analysis package right in the aim data software if you end up with your four I, I hear you Barry uh, he races ITA that I that's great the uh, uh, the the um, that will show you you know some of the different rebound compression dampening and, and histograms and, and, and give you an idea which way to go on the shocks and which way to go on the springs. So there, there are tools that are available to you in the software to help you do that. But most of your folks will, you can kind of sit down with your weights and your other things and, and, uh, and, and get a, a pretty good start on that ahead of that. Um, you mentioned earlier that you could use sensors to see a diff going soft. Can you explain that, Blake asks. Uh, yeah, what I found, and um, is is the I wanted a good tight differential, something that you know that when when the tire started spinning, it actually hooked up and, and went. And when we when we first started, I had some pretty soft differentials that uh, that didn't uh, you know, didn't lock up and and keep both tires spinning the same amount. Uh, and and Andrew from the driver pretty quickly was telling me that was spinning the inside tire to get back on the throttle and it wasn't loosening up on the way out and and that feel is what he was after so what I was looking for is even before he could feel it I wanted to know that that differential was was uh, was was starting to slip a little bit more than we wanted and we could uh, have that thing uh, tightened up repaired put new discs in it whatever it happened to be that we that we could do different cars different you know different different things we were doing could do different things so that's the way that I was looking at that so um, And uh, other than I, I think if there's any other questions, I, I think I've answered a lot of them as, as a lot of them were just comments, but um, I think I've answered a lot of those. Um, <laughs> Mike Collins, if Ruth divorces you, will you marry me? No, probably not, Mike. Uh, the <laughs> But I do appreciate uh, the help you gave us at the runoffs that that year. I I, I still think about and laugh about uh, laugh about that night. I was uh, I was stressed out. Um, the uh, what about the factory TPS sensor? The absolutely you need to be a little bit careful tapping into into stock sensors. For the most part, it's it's okay. But uh, anything that's giving you aim track mate, all, all the different brands that are out there, you, we can accept a zero to five volt sensor. And and then what we do is all we do is we grab the the si signal from that, you know, zero position throttle to 100 position throttle is one volt to four volts. We tell it one volt is zero position and four volts is five is 100 percent, and it just draws a draws the curve in between it. So um, so you end up with yes, we're, uh, <clears throat> we're we we can grab that signal uh, from the factory TPS sensors. Um, you have to worry about is that sensor accurate enough? Sometimes they do not use the uh, the number of bits to to get a, a really accurate. It may only be every you, you may only see every ten percent. It might be very jumpy in its in its line, but most of them are not like that. So you'd probably be okay. What are the differences between uh, Sean asked differences in data collection between on road and off road? They are huge. That has been a huge learning curve for me. That has been uh, very very difficult. Tire spin is is everything, and you need to figure out ways to understand that. And then the biggest thing is, is it's not as much of a driver tool, it's more of a vehicle tool because the track changes so much lap by lap by lap at, that uh, you can you just don't drive to the apex and drive out. Uh, the, the asphalt doesn't change typically. Where in the off-road, a big hole, it's muddy at first, it gets dry, then it goes blue grooved and, and slick. So there's a driver, yes, we help at some point, but we really work on the trucks. And we really work on making uh, the, the truck work as best we can. And that's how we use uh, uh, our, our AIM data systems in off-road. How often does AIM update its software? You mentioned it was a key thing to look at it buying. What you don't want is something that's static. And, and uh, you're going to see that AIM, it's every two or three weeks there's an update out there. But keep in mind that those updates go across the board so that they may not have updated their analysis software, but sometimes they do, but they're, they're also included in that same thing as all the different ECUs that we talk to. The, the Ford ECUs, the, you know, the, the, the Chryslers, and all the different aftermarket ECUs. We need to, we, we need to, uh, um, the, we need to make sure that we talk to those and with those change. So when you see updates for those, always read the, uh, the release reports to say, hey, the, uh, 
um, what was changed in this was, hey, we're reading a, a new Ford Fiesta ECU. Analysis didn't change. Then you don't need to update it. So always, always take a look at those things. Um, Mike mentioned, uh, saw Andrew working an inside line very different than the other drivers. That is exactly the stuff that we were able to work on and that everybody else didn't get, Mike, as far as data. Andrew was on TV the other day on a, on a speed, a live race in his off-road truck, and we found fairly quickly, I told him, go do two or three laps on the high side, two or three laps on the inside, and at these track conditions, Andrew, the inside is quicker. It doesn't feel like it, and it's spinning the tires coming off, but data helped us understand that by going down there, he was quicker, and then during the race, we was watching the other trucks, and he kept down there, and every other driver never went there, so, so it, was, uh, it was pretty easy that way. Jamie, thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, brake pressure steering. Uh, Bob asks, is brake pressure or steering data available from the OBT2 info? Depending on the car. Uh, MX-5, uh, certainly yes. Um, steering some, on some models of cars, other ones not. Um, brake pressure on some of them, yes. Some of them not. Uh, I believe not on the, uh, even all the way up through the uh, 99 Spec Miata side. I'm not sure what you run. So you just have to kind of dig into that a little bit. Um, what, is there, what is the next big thing in data analysis by Mason? The um, Making the software... What, what we've got is we've got myself, we've got, we've got all you users, and, and, and what we're asking you to do, not today, obviously, because we're in the middle of this, but when I'm out at the track, I'm asking, what do you what do? You do? What, and, and what are you trying to do with your data? And what do, you, what do you do something all the time? Is there something we can programmetrically do that helps? And uh, uh, oversteer, understeer might be a good one, right? That, that if we could come up with a way to accurately show understeer oversteer with GPS and, and maybe a couple of sensors. Those are things that, uh, w those are the next few things that we're doing. It's all fine tuning the data that we already have. Um, thank you all for the webinar. Let's, uh, l let me do a couple of thanks here and then and people can leave if they need to. Um, first of all, thanks Jim for uh, Mr. Drago for, for letting us do this. I, I, I appreciate it. Um, hopefully it helped uh, everybody. We had tons of people. I didn't look at the maximum numbers, but I think we were at 75 or 80 at, at, at some points. It was, uh, it was very good. Hopefully it serves a need and, and gets everybody uh, out there. I appreciate that you let us uh, use the website to, uh, to, to get it going. Hopefully it helps your customers as well, your consumers of your, of your product, and, and uh, helps the Spec Miata and the, and the Mazda people. You know, that's uh, something that uh, I really enjoy. So thanks for that, and uh, thanks everybody that did show up. And, and very uh, very active. I appreciate it. Uh, with that, I'm I'm done with the with the with the presentation as it sits. Uh, I'm going to stay here and and uh, uh, and I won't be heard if people leave. But I'm going to stay here and talk a little bit about things if anybody else wants to. But uh, again, thank you for uh, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Okay, let's look. Good references. Sean asks, are, are any good references for setting up standard analysis screens, collections of data used, used together? Uh, there's a couple of really good books out there. I don't have them here in front of me, so I don't know the names. Uh, maybe it's something I can follow up on and, and, uh, and get back with you on. But there's one brand new one out there. It's about $100, but it's, uh, they actually use some AIM information, uh, uh, AIM, MoTeC, and, uh, and, and some other ones, different, different systems. And... Um, um, the, but one of the things that AIM can do, and, and, and MoTeC and some other ones I suppose too, is what we, we have what we call profiles. And once you get what you want, say that steering position, lateral G, speed, and throttle position, once you get what, uh, what, you're, what you really want, we save it as a profile. And then from then on, you open it up, and it remembers that you had the track map open. It remembers that you, your speed, was, speed trace was in the upper one, and it was green, and it was scaled at X. And then so every time you bring your data in, you just push one button, boom, it pops open those channels and puts them exactly where you want them. That's called profiles. That's a real, real help. Competition card data logging was, uh, was, was not, a too, not, not a bad one. I enjoyed that one. Uh, Brian just mentioned that. that uh, I do have that one as well. Uh, there is a brand new one out, though. It's a white book. I just don't remember the name of it right off the top of my head. And it's brand new, probably within the last, uh, last month or so. Um, how can you tell that your GPS has use of all available satellites? 
Phil mentions. Uh, there is a button on the screen on, on the MXL itself that you can push and uh, right where you're at when you're sitting out there and it tells you the number of satellites that it's using. Or, uh, or in the software there's a, one of those channels that's on the left side in that toolbar that uh, you can just push on that and it shows you exactly how the number of satellites that it's using all the time. Uh, we see between 8 and 12 all the time. Uh, very rarely do you, do you have any, uh, uh, any, any real issues with that. Um, somebody lost the, the audio for 10 or 15 seconds. Uh, hopefully that was just, just Martin and not anybody else. Um, uh, yeah. do, you, do you do any live data push during a race? Uh, Danny asks, I think we're talking about telemetry at that point, and AIM is a company that does not do telemetry. We do not push any data out of the car. Our, dis our data systems are 100% uh, passive. So they're not even talking to the ECUs or the cars. They're just grabbing data. They don't, they, they don't talk. Um, Making Sense of Squiggly Lines by Chris Brown, I do believe is the, uh, Chris Brown is, is, I believe, the uh, author of the book that I was talking about, Joseph. So, uh, yes, uh, I think that is the book. Um, okay. Any experience with Chase Cam systems? Uh, we've ran them in the past. I've ran them in the past. Uh, nothing of, of any of the current stuff. Uh, AIM does have what we call a, uh, a Smarty Cam that allows us to put uh, data overlays right on top of it, and it's tied in directly with the uh, with the data and the video, and uh, very very handy. One of the things we don't do yet, but it's but it's uh, being worked on, is is linking that video to the uh, to the to the lines of, of, of graphs in, in, the, in the Race Studio software. So you can bring up your video, bring up your data, and when you scrub back and forth on the video, it will actually put your line exactly where you're at. That's, uh, that's coming very soon. Could you please follow up in the forums with links to the sensors you used on your SM, specifically the suspension pots and how you mounted them? You know what? I looked around for pictures of how I mounted those, and you've seen a couple of pictures of, of how we mounted them on the MX-5 in the, in the demonstration, but I will... Uh, uh, I, I will endeavor to dig a little deeper and see if I can find the spec me out. But they're they actually quite similar how we did it on the MX-5. So um, I, I will look at that. Um, can you scrub multiple laps of video at once? Not on, uh, not in the AIM system, not with the Smarty Cam stuff right now. It just builds a, a, a file, you know, a, a video file right now. Uh, in the end, we'll, we'll be able to bring those in. I don't know if they're going to allow us to do two or three laps of data and two or three laps of video at the same time. I'm not too sure. We'll have to see. Uh, Sean mentions worked with the AIM guys at Road America with MoTeC overlay on Smarty Cam. Uh, absolutely, we uh, again AIM is a big. We, we are real big about reading all the different ECUs and all the different pieces of uh, hardware that's out there. We're a, we're a, a data company. We're not an ECU company. So the uh, reading in the MoTeC overlay stuff and putting it right on the Smarty Cam. Uh, absolutely, we have uh, uh, quite a few people doing that. So um, I might have a. Spec me on a picture of your shock sensor somewhere. I think I did send some to you, Mike, at some point. So if you have those and you can find them, send one back. That would be great. Um, I hear you, Brian. We're going to try. I impressed them with my integration. <laughs> If you do not, Ken asks a good question, and that's kind of where I started. If you do not have any extra sensors, what data should you evaluate? That's why the very first slide I showed was multiple speed traces. And uh, if you don't have extra sensors and you don't have a whole lot of people to share data with and you don't have a whole lot of uh, background yet, the, the, really the first place to start is throw up a bunch of speed sensors. You're going to see the areas where you're, where you're struggling, either your car's struggling or you're struggling. And then that shows you areas to work. And then you w use the sensors you do have. Maybe it's RPM is all you got. Maybe it's, maybe, you know, maybe it's uh, lateral G's is all you have. Uh, that's then you start working. But you start off those speed traces and you put a bunch of them on top of each other. You can see pretty quickly where you're going to where where the driver is struggling or the car is struggling. So uh, and then remember somebody talked about it earlier. Uh, the lateral G's begin to get real squiggly when the car is right up on the limit. Those little things like that you can start to pick out even without steering sensor and some other things. You can check. <coughs> Pardon me again. You can see uh, when a car is right on the edge, and you can watch the trace start off at a G and a half, 1.5, and then start to lose Gs coming off, and, and, and they're really spiky. And you can pretty much 
pick that the that the the car is uh, is right on the edge and the tire's heating up and you're a little loose coming off. So uh, start to really look at right when you get out of the car and you have a feel of what the car was doing, start looking if you don't have a bunch of traces, start looking at that lateral G-trace. You can actually pick some stuff out of lateral G-traces alone that it's a little harder, substantially harder than if you have a steering and a, you know, and some of these other uh, sensors, but that really helps you. So that's that's one of the things that uh, that you can take a look at. Any comments on the new AIM Solo and its real-time real -time timing features versus traditional loggers? I am a huge fan of the new, uh, of the new AIM Solo. It's brand new, just, just getting out there. Some of you may or may not have heard it, but uh, um, it's really a kind of a data logger light slash lap, lap timer. And uh, uh, you've got the Solo, and then you've got the Solo DL. The DL is going to attach to your CAN network for your newer cars and, uh, and some expansions to... to to actually throw some other sensors at it, so um, the uh, it really is a pretty small, lightweight GPS-based package that uh, that is expandable to to some other things. It doesn't have some things that some folks might want. Doesn't have shift lights and some other things, but but uh, as a good little package to, especially for the track day cars, guys that uh, you know have their car just want to plug something in, get some lap times, and go. I've bolted it into some uh, some some Porsche, you know. Uh, guys' cars at, at track days when they were out there running around, and uh, they just love it. You get a really big, big letters, big, uh, it's got, um, um, of course, lap times based on GPS, and it's also got um, predictive lap timing real time as you're, as you're driving. So uh, those are quite a few uh, features in a, in, a, in a small little package that's really affordable. Everybody take a look at the AIM Solo if you haven't looked at it yet for, for other cars. Perfect. Okay. Great. If um, if that is it, I guess we're probably done. Uh, um, again, I appreciate everybody's uh, everybody joining. If you want to, uh, if you want to, any more information, I'm always open. Send me some of your data or whatever, and uh, ask me some questions. Or we can do some of these. Uh, this is go to webinar, where they go to meeting, where it's more of a one-on-one. -on -one. I can look at your screen. You can grab the mouse. You can show me where you're having areas. If you want to do a little bit of that, uh, just let me know, and we can. Uh, we can do a few things. So, but either way, uh, thanks for coming. Um, appreciate it. Anytime you need any help, just give us a holler and, uh, and we'll see you guys around. Talk to you soon. Thanks guys. Over and out.